Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Channel 73 and Verizon Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the May 2nd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any changes. Hearing none, the agen agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. Discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. And discuss public security if the public body determines the public Dissuasion would constitute a risk to the public or to public security, including the deployment of fire and police services and staff and the development and implementation of emergency plans. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for this I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Do I have a second? Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Principal Hawthorne Elementary School. Principal Hernwood Elementary School. Assistant Principal Berkshire Elementary School. Assistant Principal Colgate Elementary School. And Assistant Principal Sparrows Point High School. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Booker DeWire. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Savoy. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Williams? Thank you. Our four first appointment is Jennifer Birch as the, as, as the principal of Hawthorne Elementary School. Attending with her is her partner, Amanda Collins. I've asked that they stand at this time. Yeah, there she is. 
has over 21 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools. Prior to this appointment, she served as the acting principal at Hawthorne Elementary School. Uh, prior to that role, she served as an assistant principal at Hawthorne Elementary School, Middlesex Elementary School, and Dunbarton Middle School. Prior to those experiences, she served as a school counselor at Dundalk Middle School and Pine Grove. And finally, she served as a teacher, special ed, at Shady Spring Elementary and Riverview Elementary. Congratulations. Where is she? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tamara R. Harris Murphy as the principal of Hernwood Elementary School. <laughs> Joining her this evening is her husband, Ernest Murphy, please stand, and her son, Caden. Yeah. Tamara R. Harris Murphy brings over 18 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Prior to this appointment, Ms. Harris Murphy served as the assistant principal at Edmondson Heights Elementary School. She served as a stat teacher at Newtown Elementary School and a classroom teacher at Halstead Academy. Her prior experience includes Baltimore City Public Schools and Tuscaloosa County School System. Congratulations. Next, we have Amanda Koslowski as the assistant principal at Berkshire Elementary School. Please stand and attending with her is her husband, Chad Koslowski, and principal Christina Davis at Shady, Shady Plains Elementary School. Where's Miss Davis? Is she here? There she is. Um, Amanda Koslowski brings over 10 years of experience at Baltimore County Public Schools. Prior to this appointment, she served as a teacher, staff development teacher at uh, Sandy Plains Elementary School, staff development teacher in the Office of Staff Relations, and teacher of classroom at Vincent Farm Elementary School. Congratulations. Next, we have Alay D. Wolf as the assistant principal at Sparrows Point High School. Please stand. There she is. First, her husband, Timothy Wolf. Please stand. Wolf brings over 19 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Prior to this appointment, she served as a teacher, social and emotional learning. English teacher, stat teacher, and special ed teacher at Sparrows Point High School. Congratulations. <laughs> and watching virtually is Laura L. Marvin Basta as the assistant principal at Colgate Elementary School. She brings over 20 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools prior to this appointment. Laura served as a community school facilitator at Colgate Elementary School, classroom teacher at Colgate Elementary School, and art teacher at Colgate Elementary School. So congratulations, Laura L. Marvin Basta. <laughs> that concludes the appointments. Congratulations. congratulations to everyone. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 of the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. For those who were not selected through the online registration, a wait list sign-up sheet was available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. If a registered speaker is absent, speaker slots will be reassigned from the wait list so that the 10 speaker slots are allocated. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct 
of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which I will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at, BCPS, at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. Let's see. I will now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Cindy Sexton, representing TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Our educators in Baltimore County deserve more. More respect, more resources, more support, and more compensation. Because our students deserve a world-class education, and that starts with our educators. With Teacher Appreciation Week next week, I want to say thank you to all our educators who give so much of themselves every single day because we love our students and we want them to thrive and grow in all aspects. Academically, certainly, emotionally, physically, everything to make a well-rounded, productive member of society. And we as a school system need to do everything we can to recruit and retain those educators. I truly wish I did not have to come to every board meeting and talk about money. There are so many other things we could and should be focusing on to support our students, and almost every single one of those things starts with the educator. Using data from the Maryland State Department of Education, in the 21-22 school year, BCPS actually ended the year with more vacancies than they started with. And statewide, the reason most teachers are leaving are either a voluntary resignation or taking another education-related job, i.e. going to work at another school system. And also, while we realize that we need educators who look like our students, our black and Hispanic teachers are leaving at higher rates than our white teachers. That is not okay. Also, according to the data, teacher shortages are driven by local conditions. We have work to do in Baltimore County. We need to dig deep, and honestly and then authentically work together to address these local conditions that are driving our educators out. We know some are from state and national directives. Our special educators and related service providers have untenable workloads, but we can and must change the narrative and the practice so we can keep our educators. As we go into Teacher Appreciation Week, I ask this board and the school system two things. First, yes, can we please finish our negotiations with a compensation package that will truly work towards recruiting and retaining our educators? And second, can we have the authentic conversations and actions to identify and improve the conditions that are driving educators out of the profession? If we really want to show our teachers our appreciation, we must do this work because our educators are worth it and more importantly, our students deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Yeager, BCPS student. Good evening. Hello. Hello. My name is Rachel Yeager and I'm a fifth grader at Hampton Elementary. I'm here to speak for the students of Hampton about the lunches. The lunches don't seem very healthy or fulfilling. And there have been several times when the milk, milk and yogurt have been expired. Another thing is that the line takes so long because our school is so overcrowded that we don't have enough time to eat. Also, the pizza we used to get was much better than the new kind we have, have been getting this year. Plus, the fresh fruits and vegetables are often mushy or moldy. 
there also isn't enough. Most of the time, there are only two or three items in the lunch. Lunch is a very important meal of the day, so, so we can stay focused and learn. There are kids that buy lunch every day, and it is very unsatisfying. I bet if you tried some of the lunches, you, will, you wouldn't like them at all. We would love to see dairy that is not expired, produce that is edible, more variety, and bigger portions. A better lunch makes a better day. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marlena Colton Purcell from the Southwest Area Educational Advisory Councils. You have to follow that one, Ms. Purcell. I know. I know. <laughs> I saw your face. <laughs> yes, that face of mine gets me in trouble. Good evening, everyone. Good Thank evening. you so very much for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. For the record, my name is Marlena Colleton Purcell. I am the chair for the Southwest Area Education Advisory Council. Um, tonight, I am, of course, starting off with my kudos, claps, and cheers. And I just wanted to um, highlight um, today um, Ms. Marjorie Wright. I hope I got, got that right. Um, she is the administrative uh, secretary at Lansdowne High School. And she was named tonight, today as the Educational Support Professional of the Year. So congratulations. <laughs> Another um, opportunity to cheer. We are, again, having our second Monday meeting. And we are combining it with Northwest Area Education Advisory Council, which means we are coming together as a West Zone. Please tune in via Zoom on next Monday at 7 p.m. If you have not received a flyer as of yet, please check with your principal and or email um, Southwest email account or Northwest email account. I was going to direct it here. but um, Now for a report from last month's joint meeting. During our joint Southwest Central Area Education Advisory Council, we had the honor of hosting a panel of students from Baltimore County Public Schools. The student voices do matter. So much so, they had articulated in their experience, which expressed their appreciation to having their voices heard. We believe we should have this type of meeting annually where students' voices are heard. We ask students questions about safety, about their learning environment, their hopes um, for the new superintendent. We, through this, we learned that they have concerns about effectiveness effectiveness of their ALICE training, especially due to experiences such as the threats that occurred at Towson High School. They worry about the ability um, of teachers to enforce a respect or non-bullying environment and believe in the importance of student relationships, teacher-student relationships. They also express concerns about their class sizes greater than 27, as they experience class sizes as much as 33 students. In fact, they noted that small class sizes improve their ability to focus, their ability to build relationships with their teachers allows more time for students to ask questions and be heard as well as a possibility of group collaboration in smaller classes. They also believe small class sizes enforces consequences which are important to reduce disruptiveness to improve their um, learning environment. Finally, the students hope that their next superintendent will prioritize students and um, prioritize the student voices as well as teachers. I thank you for the time that has been given, and we look forward to everyone coming out to next Monday's meeting, which is about summer programs and learning opportunities. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Kanaya McKenzie. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kina McKenzie. Uh, I have a nephew that attends Dundalk High School. Uh, and in that high school, they have a book called Push uh, by Sapphire. Uh, it's in his high school along with nine others that I know of in Baltimore County. Uh, I'm, 
I'm here today simply asking that sexually explicit, vulgar, and or obscene materials not be available within our public schools, where parents have diminished control of what our children can access or read. Now, this book uh, mentions the N-word 22 times. Uh, it mentions the F-word uh, also in this book 83 times. Um, you know, the pr prior speaker talked about a, a learning environment for our children and talked about some of the things that our kids are experiencing socially, uh, educationally, and to me, this book does not add to that or should be uh, in appropriate in a learning environment. I want to read just a small snippet of what this book, again, it's Push by Sapphire uh, has. It's page 72 says here, um, I don't fucks boys, but I pregnant. I'm pregnant. My father fuck me, and she know it. She kick me in my head when I'm pregnant. I think my daddy, he stink. The white shit drip off his dick. Lick it, lick it. I hate that. But then I feel the hot sauce, hot cha-cha feeling when he be fucking me. I get so confused, I hate him, but my pussy be popping. He say that, Biff mama, your pussy is popping. I hate myself when I feel good. So again, I, I do not understand what uh, capacity this is or would be in our children's, our boys and girls, high schools, library. I don't understand the function of it. I don't understand how this would assist or help our children in any social or educational environment. Uh, it's vulgar. It's gross. And I, I'm simply asking that this, these materials be removed immediately immediately. We wonder why our children are exhibiting certain behaviors now. Uh, we're seeing this. And th there are books like this within their libraries that they have access to, and they shouldn't. And I hope you will agree with me. I didn't even want to read it here. We have children here. I have a son. I have a nephew. I wouldn't even play a song on the radio with them in the car with this type of language. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shuli Shu. Good evening. Good evening. Dear Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Dr. Williams, and members of the board, my name is Shuli Xia, and I'm the president of Chinese American Parent Association of Baltimore, in short, Kappa BC. Today is May 2nd. I came here last time and shared with you the, that May is APIDA Heritage Month. APIDA stands for Asian Pacific Islander Days American. Since 1992, APIDA Heritage Month has been celebrated annually in May to recognize and honor the contributions, achievements, and cultures of East and Southeast Asian and Pacific Islander in the United States. As we all know, diversity is one of the di defining characteristics of our country. And it is important that we recognize and celebrate the unique contributions of all groups. Unfortunately, for too long, the history and experience of APIDA individuals have been marginalized or overlooked in our public school education system. APIDA Heritage Month is an excellent way to explore the rich history and cultures of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and to analyze the challenges and, that faced by the APIDA community. Furthermore, as with other similarly themed months, it is important not to limit the, the exploration of APIDA history and cultures into just one month throughout the, the year. So I recommend the inclusion of APIDA history and cultures in the BCPS curriculum. It is also important to ensure that teachers receive adequate training and support to effectively teach those contents. One immediate action our public school could take is include books about APIDA history and cultures in our local school libraries. Last time, and also include this time, other parents came to the BOE meeting and strongly opposed the inclusion of the books such as Gender Queer, Long Voice, or Push You Have Heard in our school libraries. We understand that the school is trying to, to promote diversity and inclusion with these books. However, the content of this book can potentially promote 
gender confusion, and the pictures and con description in these books are harmful to immature young minds. There are so many non-controversial ways to embrace diversity, including books about Epita history and cultures where facilitate a great understanding and appreciation of our di diversity. As the Epita group comprises nearly 7% of the entire population in the United States. Our organization is committed to supporting our public school education and promoting a positive and inclusive learning environment for all students. We'll be happy to work with BOE and to discuss plans to work on those issues, including book selection. Thank you for attention to this matter. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lena Amick. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I want to especially welcome our newest board members um, who have taken up the essential task of facilitating a quality education for all students in Baltimore County. Um, I'm one of our nearly 10,000 teachers, and I hope you know that we are eager to share what we know, to collaborate on solutions, and to contribute to the success and care for all students in BCPS in all their diverse experiences, skills, racial identities, languages, cultures, and gender expressions and identities. My name is Lena Amick, and I am a social studies teacher at Parkville High School, a proud TABCO member. I've been teaching for six years with BCPS and a co-chair of the Government Relations Advocacy and Solidarity Committee of TABCO. I'm here to speak with you tonight about the importance of fairly compensating educators and all school staff in creating a successful school system. Currently, BCPS ranks ninth in the state for teacher compensation. This spring, BCPS has made great movement towards fulfilling last year's agreement to a shorter, fairer salary scale. But the proposal on the table is still not competitive with our neighboring counties. What BCPS has proposed is inadequate to address, to attract skilled educators in our county and keep our hardworking teachers here. It's a really clear equation. Inadequate compensation directly leads to high turnover. And high turnover leads to worse schools. That means poor academic performance, failure to provide federally mandated services, inability to support students through a nationwide epidemic of mental health crisis. When employees don't feel their time, effort, and professional development is rewarded for what it's worth, they seek employment elsewhere. And we can see that in the 621 educators and counting that have left our district this year. That is expertise that we are not easily going to replace or get back. Um, I want to share a little bit about what those vacant positions and high turnover mean for our students by giving you some examples. One of my friends who teaches in a West Side high school, she said her school had a thri thriving theater program for five years because of one drama teacher. She left for a private school last year, seeking a less stressful workload, and now those students don't take drama at all. A veteran middle school teacher pointed out that because there's not enough teachers, students are being taught by teachers who are maxed out, and that there is not enough um, ability to support those new teachers to learn the skills they need. Patience is thinner, and students are getting much less feedback on their work and less individual attention. And for me, a passion of mine is teaching ESOL, and those students need extra supports that we're simply not able to give them. I have students cry in my room every week and I give them a tissue and a granola bar because there are no counselors available because our counselors are working so hard just to support other students in the building. Um, I wanna end with a remark from an English teacher at Parkville. He says, as a first year teacher in BCPS, the current salary scale is daunting. When I think about everything I've learned this year, I'm excited to try new things, to learn from my mistakes. That excitement is dampened by feeling like my salary scale will not be in Thank you. Our next speaker is Helene Groves. Good evening. Good evening. Sorry. <laughs> I'm used to much smaller chairs. Good evening, Chairwoman Lichter and esteemed board members. My name is Helen Groves, and I am an early childhood special educator and SEL teacher at the fabulous Campfield Early Learning Center. My principal insisted I add that adjective at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm here this evening to thank you for your time and to ask that you work with our educators and support staff to build a better foundation for all of our students. 
contract negotiations for educators, nurses, counselors, and all other certified staff represented by the Teachers Association of Baltimore County are ongoing. BCPS has made great strides toward fulfillment of the agreement approved last year to compress our lengthy salary scales and create equitable step increases. We recognize the efforts of the BCPS um, negotiations team and we appreciate your willingness to continue to work towards improvement. However, even with the current offering, the BCPS contract proposal does not um, propel us into a competitive place among neighboring counties. The exodus of educators, including mental health staff, nurses, and related service providers, is evidence of the need for BCPS to approve more competitive means of compensation. The loss of veteran teachers and the inability to retain new teachers within our county leads to an unstable and stressful learning environment for our students and causes strain on community relationships. As board members, you have all pledged to empower our school system to be among the highest performing school systems in the nation by raising the bar, closing the gap, and preparing every student for the teacher. On the website under core values is the following statement. We will do whatever it takes to ensure that every student learns and succeeds. And regardless of race, ethnicity, gender orientation, socioeconomic status, language proficiency, or disability, every student will be successful when provided with high expectations and appropriate supports. Additionally, it notes that a high performing workforce is essential to the BCPS becoming a world class school system. And the statement, positive and productive relationships among all members of Team BCPS are built through meaningful communication and engagement, which we appreciate. Agreeing to fund the compressed salary scale empowers our county to retain excellent educators and provides incentive for new educators to join us. There is incredible potential within Team BCPS. We need your support in affirming the value of both our educators and our students. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker, which is virtual, is Kenneth Benjis. Hi, good evening. Thank you, board, for all of your hard work and welcome new members. My name is Ken Benjis, a teacher in Baltimore County Public Schools. I'd like to echo the sentiments of Cindy Sexton and Lena Amick, two amazing leaders and BCPS educators. I'm asking you to please fund the new salary scale um, and make a strong effort to attract new and veteran educators. You know, a, a lot, you know, teachers all talk, right? And I've brought my fair share of people into this system and it's, it's, not, a, it's not happening like that anymore. <laughs> it used to be easy to convince people. You know, we paid better than some surrounding counties. We had an amazing curriculum. And those two things are not currently the situation. My past few interns, I've probably had six interns over the past five years. One applied to Baltimore County Public Schools and she resigned earlier this year. Um, my current intern from just this uh, a few months ago did not apply to Baltimore County Public Schools and explicitly cited low pay compared to surrounding counties. Last year we had hundreds of openings and this year is the same, students are suffering teachers are suffering but let's be real the real the real people suffering here are the students um much love to all of our substitutes but when they are teaching a course for the entire year they the students are not getting the same level that they would be getting from a fully certified teacher um it, it is really important i think for the board and everyone in baltimore county to do what they can to attract the best educators both new educators and to keep those veteran educators in order to reduce our turnover. Thank you so much for your um, your time this evening, and I really wish that you consider this request. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lazarus Volokas. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Volikas. <laughs> oh. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Um, First of all, thank you, Chair Lichter, and the rest of the board for allowing me to have this opportunity to speak. Um, I appreciate your willingness to uh, be open to public feedback regarding the schools in, in our communities. Um, I, what I wanted to talk about was the size of Baltimore County and BCPS. Um, there's over 175 schools and over 110,000 students in our county. And suffice to say, this is very large, 
and in my experience has resulted in an administrative system that is a bit unwieldy. Our county is very diverse in pretty much all ways, not only socioeconomically, ethnically, racially, different you know, genders, but some people who have lived here for generations, some who are new to the state or um, even immigrants to our country. Um, the county goes from the very rural edge with Pennsylvania um, to you know, very urban areas on the city border and you know, everything in between. Um, we literally have different school closures due to different weather in parts of the, the, the BCBS county, so, uh, BCBS area. So obviously it's very diverse with different, uh, different needs. My concern is that as a result of this, um, we have different needs to address and countywide one size fits all implementation of policies ends up being subpar for everyone because it's not addressing the needs of, of individual schools, individual people, it's, it's just everything. Um, and in my experience, there, there are so many people that are involved in, in the decision-making process. There's a tendency to pass the buck when people are saying it's not their role, they're just following policy, their hands are tied, et cetera. I believe we need to have smaller dynamic leadership that can rapidly address local issues and most importantly take ownership to address individual or local, you know, couple of schools' needs. We need to have people who can closely connect to the schools who have both willingness, authority, and flexibility to solve problems without a lot of bureaucracy. Um, I grew up in a different state where I have different experience because we had school districts with a single high school and all the feeders went into it. And, this, and, and that had their own superintendents and their own school boards and the small local governance allowed for those schools to really be dynamic and be tailor-made to the needs of the community. Um, I would advocate for BCPS to be divided into smaller units. I'm not saying each high school is their own unit, but perhaps something that, uh, you know, once it could be more dynamic and more attuned to their communities, um, maybe I was thinking something in the realm of maybe the area advisory councils could kind of be a model of like how to kind of break it down into smaller areas um, that could run schools, um, have a certain amount of authority and certain responsibility, and then there could still be a, a larger countywide umbrella administration for larger issues, but much fewer ones that wouldn't need, you know, quite so one size fits all. Um, we continue to lose many students to public to private schools, and I think a big part of that is a failure to address the concerns of uh, teachers, administrators, parents, and families at the individual schools. Um, and, you know, I just think that there we can do better with that. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Adams. Just in case I run out of time. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Try really hard to speed talk clearly. <laughs> um, I would like to say welcome to our three newest board members, uh, Mr. Young, Mrs. Booker Dwyer, and Mrs. Frempong. You guys really entered and hit the ground running, so thank you and good luck. My name is Amy Adams, and I'm here representing uh, 5,000 members of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. We are BCPS parents, students, teachers, taxpayers, and stakeholders who have formed a community that advocates for what is best for all students in BCPS. I would like I'd like to use my time to mention three topics of importance to our coalition members. First, with so many students academically behind, what is the criteria for summer help? How do parents find this information in writing in order to advocate for their child to their school principal? Second, regarding the last curriculum meeting, there were poor growth performance slide used throughout the pilot to promote my view literacy to this board as a selling point, until they were not. A 1% growth in a showcase state is concerning. What data points has this board seen, other than the report that teachers like HMH into reading better than my view, to feel confident approving a $10 million contract at? Remember, the former board was not comfortable with BCPS having piloted my view for two months. And now with the info gleamed from a longer pilot, the pilot was discontinued and not recommended to proceed from CNI. It's super important that teachers like HMH, but it's even more important that it works. Ed Reports doesn't say it works. Ed Reports tells you that a product meets standards. Clearly, Ed Reports rating did not make my view a great program for our teachers to use. So what do we really know about HMH except that it isn't my view? Do you have the information either from staff or from doing your own research to say unequivocally that HMH into reading is what we need to move all students in a better direction? Perhaps this is something to consider, ask for, or look into prior to the vote approving the contract. Our students are depending on you to make the best choice, not just the one choice that's left because you've been backed into a corner to choose something. Finally, the superintendent search. 
you are mostly a newly seated board members were given five months to find a qualified superintendent to lead the 25th largest school system in the country. You hired a search form, held community input sessions, reviewed 24 applicants to the point of narrowing it down to four individuals in three months, all while learning your rules and fulfilling your own responsibilities. The final four candidates will go through interview process next week. Since this process is not open to members of the public, including parents, our members would love to know. How has the feedback from the public helped you identify what to ask the candidates? Have you taken the time to read the hundreds of pages of feedback? What qualities and qualifications are you looking for in a potential superintendent? How are you representing your communities and making your decision? I can tell you that coalition members are counting on an individual that has a clear short-term plan with measurable goals and a timeline, someone who is willing to hold employees at all levels to high academic standards to improve academic outcomes and who will make necessary changes to better serve students first. Someone who can clearly identify BCPS's shortcomings when formulating their short and long-term plans. Someone who believes that all children are capable of learning and understands that it is the school system's primary mission, purpose, and responsibility to teach them so they can truly be college and career ready. I hope that you will ponder these coalition concerns and act in the best interest of our children who desperately need you to make good decisions. Got it in. Thank you. You did it. Thanks. Our next speaker is Joanne Seward. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm following up a little bit uh, about some of the books that are now in the public high school libraries. I'm a concerned mother, grandmother, and retired teacher in relation to the pornographic books with explicit, detailed sexual illustrations and titles, including offensive vocabulary that are currently sitting on bookshelves in high school libraries in Baltimore County, namely the book Gender Queer. It's been stated in correspondences and in the media that these books contain educational value. So the question becomes, where is these books is the educational value where there is same sex mutual fondling of genitalia and heavy petting and kissing between members of the same sex. The vulgar language has no educational value as well that's contained in these books. A consideration needs to be made about the damage that's being done here. This book captures the innocence of high school students who may never have questioned their sexual identity in the first place. Critics writing book reviews heap praise on the book, which stokes the student's curiosity. It traps and tricks them in an underhanded manner to check it out, read it, and most likely pass it around to fellow classmates. Also, there should not be any kind of finger pointing and accusing that concerned parents and citizens, of which there are many, are calling for the banning of all books in all the high school libraries, which is not true. But after exposing the pornographic pictures and vulgar vocabulary, it has now become obvious which one should be banned. Thank you for giving me the time to express what is being done here to the youth. Indoctrination, the raping of youth innocence, and recruitment into a questionable lifestyle. Now, just off the cuff, I was reading a portion of this. And since I have about 20 seconds, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just because you don't have a copy. So he's on me. Then he reach over to Precious, stick with his finger between my legs. I say, Carl, what you doing? He say, shut up, you big fat ass. I rest my case. Our next, spe our next speaker is Kapathia Campbell, virtual. Good evening, Chair Lecter, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. My name is Kapathia Campbell, and yes, I'm that media specialist. 
I have proudly served Hepville Elementary for over 20 years. And also, I am the newly elected board member for TAPCO, and I'm serving District 1. First, I want to say thank you, Dr. Williams, for your leadership over the last four years. We at Hepville, we are so grateful for your, your support especially when you came to our Black History Month celebration. Unfortunately, I am unable to attend in person this evening because I'm still at work. This is work that I don't mind doing with my school community. This evening, my principal, Principal Fildeman, Ms. Shinton, our educators, and over 200 students and parents participated in our spring family engagement night. We had two sessions. Our students presented their artwork and the second session was co-hosted by our staff and a fantastic group called Support by Design. Our parents received information on our black and brown boys of color promising practices from the field. That's why I'm speaking to you virtually. Thank you so much for all of the labor that you put forth every day on behalf of our community, our professions, and especially our students. But board members, I wanna to say to you, you're not done yet. Chair Lecter, as a former teacher, administrator, and executive director, you know that being an educator is one of the thankless jobs on this planet. But you also know that we are not in it for the thank yous or the accolades. We are here because it's our true labor of love. Madam Chair, my time is winding down here at Baltimore County Public Schools. But until then, I have decided to use my voice to speak for the young educators who has to work three jobs to pay their rent. For that young educator who needs a balanced life, but they work on the weekends creating lesson plans. I'm here to speak for that young educator who decided not to drive Uber tonight, but to participate in our spring family engagement. <coughs> Board members, 1,000 tongues will never be able to say thank you for the educators and all that we do. But putting your support behind funding, recruiting, and retaining great educators will send the message that you are not done yet. Young educators deserve the dignity to earn a decent wage. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Short amount of time. Thank you. Thank you. We our need our contract. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our last speaker is Teresa Myers. Good evening, and thank you, Board of Ed members, for your time tonight. My name is Teresa Myers. I'm a parent of two school-age children. I have lived in Baltimore County since 1981 and attended Baltimore County Public Schools till 10th grade. Six years ago, my husband and I made the decision to pull both of our children out of Baltimore County Public Schools. And now, more than ever, I am 100% confident that my husband and I made the right decision, as Baltimore County Public Schools are becoming more unsafe every day. Did you know that since 2018, the publication Education Week has been tracking school shootings and there have been more than 160. There were 51 injuries or deaths in 2022, the most school shootings since 2018. 2021 had 35, 2020 had 10, 2019 and 2018 had 24. With the safety of Baltimore County Public Schools, children, teachers and staff, why would Baltimore County School Libraries have Assassination Classroom, Book One, Story and Art by Yusume, Yusume Matsui? 
This book is in 13 Baltimore County Public High School libraries. Assassination Classroom is a series. A group of students attempt to kill their teacher who is teaching them how to become assassins. Yes, you heard me correctly. This is about students attempting to kill their teacher. Here are just some of the images in this so-called graphic novel. It starts with classroom one, killing time in homeroom. Notice all the types of guns in this student, the students are holding and pointing towards the teacher. The next page is a gun that says start, pointing over to a smiling teacher and students holding a gun guns saying assassins we are. The next pages are guns going off, pow, pow. The class cannot say the pledge because guns are going off. The teacher takes attendance while guns are going off. The students say we are assassins and our target is our teacher. Later in the book, of course, there is more shooting going on and a student says, if you don't like it, kill my parents kill whoever. I've been wanting to kill a teacher. Why is this book in Baltimore County School Public Libraries? I'm simply asking that sexually explicit, vulgar, and or obscene materials not be available within our public schools where parents have diminished control of what their children have access to or read. I will be submitting a citizen's review of materials for this book to your chief academic officer, Mary McComas, to review by your board. Thank you and please think about the safety of your of children, teachers, and staff. Okay. And that ends our public portion public comment portion of our meeting. The next item on the agenda, oops. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I am pleased to present the superintendent's report to the board and Team BCPS on behalf of Dr. Williams. This report includes celebrations, updates, and evidence of our strategic plan, the Compass, our pathway to excellence in action. Yesterday was National Principals Day. Please join us in thanking our amazing Team BCPS principals for everything that they do. Please give your favorite principal a social media shout out using the hashtag ThanksBCPSPrincipals. May 1st through 5th is Substitute Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you, substitute teachers, for the crucial role that you play in our schools. Let's hear it for Team BCPS teachers. Thank you for your enthusiasm, expertise, and dedication. Teacher Appreciation Week is May 8th through 12th. Congratulations to our ESP of the Year, Marjorie Wright, Admin Secretary at Lansdowne High School. She was honored and recognized today. On April 19th, we celebrated our first Champion for Children event during which we showcased excellence in education. Join me in congratulating AFSME Employee of the Year, Vance Scovins, Supervisory Leader of the Year, Denise Salisbury, Transportation Champion, Inger Johnson, Su Supporting Services Employee of the Year, Joanna Crandall Sick, Volunteer Champion, Ramona Basilio, Business Partner Champion, Scott Dorsey, and Rising Star Teacher of the Year, Lauren Deardorff. Congratulations to Principal of the Year, Kenwood High School Principal, Brian Powell. 
congratulations again to Assistant Principal of the Year, Towson High School Assistant Principal Nicole Bridges. Please join me in congratulating BCPS Teacher of the Year, Beverly Folkoff. A teacher for 16 years, half of them at Relay Elementary, Ms. Folkoff teaches students in the Functional Academic Learning Support Program at Relay. She is a graduate of Towson University and the University of Virginia. She wanted anything but to become an educator until a high school internship in a self-contained kindergarten classroom convinced her of her lifelong calling. I fell in love, she says, with the students, the challenges, the creativity the job required, the collaboration, and problem solving. The BCPS Teacher of the Year will represent the school system and its more than 9,000 professional educators in the Maryland State Teacher of the Year program. We salute you, Ms. Folkoff. In honor of the class of 2023, BCPS will continue to profile one senior from each high school. A new profile will be posted daily until May 19th, the last day for seniors. These profiles highlight the intellectual and personal strengths of our seniors. Congratulations to the class of 2023. The U.S. Department of Education announced last week that Watershed Public Charter School in Windsor Mill is among the 2023 U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools. Watershed Public Charter School was nominated by the Maryland State Department of Education. These students are stewards of the environment and environmental awareness is a part of the school culture. Congratulations to Watershed. Last Saturday, NAACP Baltimore County hosted the annual AXO competition at Newtown High School featuring high school students. Students competed in the arts, science, math, and engineering. Great job to all of our participants and congratulations to all of the award winners. Yesterday, Team BCPS celebrated the school system's culture of promoting higher education and career preparation on BCPS College and Career Decision Day, all graduating seniors who have committed to a college or university or career plans were asked to share that news on social media using the hashtag BCPS Decision Day. May is the season of celebration. Graduations will begin on May 23rd at Ridge Ruxton. We want to congratulate all of our seniors in the class of 2023. BCPS is still hiring. We are collaboratively working to address the effects of the nationwide staffing shortage. Upcoming job fairs for this month and the month of June are listed on the slide. We invite our community to join Team BCPS. We will continue to update the board, our community, and Team BCPS. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Next is chair report, and I'm pleased to provide another update on our national search for the next superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools. On April 25th, the board met with McPherson and Jacobson, LLC, our executive search firm, to discuss and review the applications of candidates. Our search for a superintendent attracted interest from 24 candidates, a diverse pool of applicants who had a wide, range, a wide array of experiences and expertise. As we shared in the community update last week, applicants came from 15 states and were comprised of superintendents, both current and those who have previously served in that role, central office administrators, and other local and state educational leaders. Our review and conversations were guided by our board's core values, strategic priorities, and the desired characteristics hundreds of members of Team BCPS community shared during six community forums, focus groups, and by an online survey. On behalf of the board, I'd like to thank those members of Team BCPS for their willingness to participate in these important community conversations and provide insights throughout the community engagement phase of the process. After careful and thorough deliberation, the board has selected four finalists for a final round of inter interviews, which are scheduled to take place the second week of May. These interviews will provide an opportunity for the board to learn more about the candidates, their vision for the system, and the work ahead. We will take a deeper dive into their applications, experiences, and references, and thoroughly evaluate 
whether they would be a good fit for our unique and richly diverse school system. The four finalists will also participate in a series of panel interviews with members of identified stakeholder groups that represent students, parents, educational councils, multicultural and civic organizations, employee associations, and area advisory councils. The full list of participating identified stakeholder groups is available on the superintendent search website. I do want to acknowledge that we have heard from a few stakeholders who have had questions about how parents and other stakeholders are selected to participate in the final round of interviews and what the process looks like. It's important to note that parents, students, staff, and community members who will participate in the final interviews are representation of the diverse perspectives and lived experiences of Dean team BCPS stakeholders. These individuals are part of several identified stakeholder groups in BCPS. The groups provide multiple opportunities for other BCPS stakeholders to connect with the board and system leadership to share their thoughts, questions, and concerns about the things that are happening in the system. We deeply value the input, time, and commitment of members of these groups, and we know they will provide us with their honest and insightful input on the finalist. Once the final interviews are completed, the board will review the input from each member of the stakeholder groups and work in collaboration with the executive search firm to identify the preferred candidate for superintendent. We anticipate that the announcement of the selection of the preferred candidate will take place the third or fourth week of May. Upon, a pri upon approval, of the conditional appointment of the new superintendent, a series of public meetings will be scheduled for the community to meet the new superintendent. The meetings will offer the superintendent the opportunity to meet with parent, business, education, civic, community leaders, and the community at large. Every effort is being taken to ensure the integrity of the process and the viability of the candidates. The board also remains committed to maintaining the confidentiality of candidates in order to find the best leader for BCPS. We will continue to provide updates on the search process and post information on the superintendent search website. Once again, I'd like to thank Team BCPS for being a part of this important process. The next topic I want to address is our area educational advisory councils. Dr. Williams, um, Board of Education members, Acting Chief of Staff, Dr. Molinex, Acting Chief of Schools, Dr. Molinex, all had a chance to meet last week with the coordinator of the AEAC chairs, of the coordinator of the AEAC, the chairs of the councils, and other members. We had a very productive meeting focusing on how we can strengthen the relationship between the board and our area educational advisory councils. I want to read the policy statement as outlined in policy 1230. The board believes that area education advisory councils exist to improve the quality of education in Baltimore County and to strengthen the relationship between the school system and the community by serving as informed advisors to the board on public school issues and by promoting interest and involvement in the school system. The board establishes the AEACs as standing committees which report directly to the board. With careful attention to input from the community, AEACs are charged with advising the board on issues that affect students, families, communities, and schools. The biggest obstacle right now affecting the AEACs is membership. All five councils are looking for additional members at this time. Members are appointed by the board. Please consider attending an upcoming meeting. If you're interested in becoming a member of one of the five councils, please email the current chair for additional information and for next steps. Email contacts are included on the BCPS website along with meeting dates, times, locations, and topics. Search, advis search advisory councils and you will find the information. I'm looking forward to the many events taking place during the BCPS during the remainder of the school year that will celebrate the many accomplishments of our students and staff. So thank you for listening. And the next item on the agenda is student board members report. And for that, I call Ms. Hassan. Thank you and good evening everyone. It is as always an honor to be giving you all my second to last student member of the board report. As I reflect on this past year, I cannot wait to share with you the wonderful and thought provoking lessons our students and system has taught me as I finish out my term and pass the torch on to my successor. 
I would like to take the time today to formally congratulate our next Baltimore County Public Schools student member of the board. On March 23rd, BCPS students, secondary students, casted their votes for the next student member and selected my successor. Our 43rd student member of the board, or SMOB, is Kayla Drummond, a current junior at Parkville High School. I cannot be more excited for Kayla, and I absolutely cannot wait to see the wonderful things she accomplishes during her term. Kayla will undoubtedly pave her own path as she follows the legacy of our powerful student members. I hope that you all value her voice as essential to our process and most importantly, honor her vote as one that is representative of our students. The stories she will share and her opinions will undoubtedly reflect many of the experiences that we must seek out to the best of our ability. Just yesterday, um, as you all know, BCPS celebrated Decision Day, where our seniors shared their future plans, and I once again cannot be more proud of my class, the graduating class of 2023. Our students have shown their excellence time and time again, and we must collectively take the time to celebrate everything from their day one to middle school, and finally to walking across that stage and receiving their diploma. This past month, mental health has remained a strong focus of mine as BCPS showcased our Mind Over Matters campaign where we heard from BCPS graduates about their experiences with mental health and how they grew into their identity as well as viewed workshops from individuals and organizations across the county. I heard feedback from BCPS's Mental Health Advisory Council regarding the mental health resolution and next steps and look forward to implementing that before the end of my tenure and filmed the Let's Talk About It episodes on BCPS TV, talking about resources, wonderful estab established communities and programs that we have as of right now, and most importantly, how to get help if you need it. I cannot express to you my pride and joy in serving this community and our students, and absolutely cannot wait to share my bittersweet final student member of the board report in June. So as always, thank you so much, and let's get in good trouble. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Good evening. Good evening. Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, members of the board. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session and took action on the following case, HE 23-29. Now would be the appropriate time for the board to confirm the action that it took on that item. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 23-29 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Harvey. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Hassan. Thank you, thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dreyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Burns. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Harvey, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, May 1st, 2023. Items K-1 through K-10 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve items K-1 through K-10? So moved, Dominowski. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation came from the committee. Any discussion? I'm sorry, I didn't get this in quickly enough, but can I just ask a question about number two? I don't know if we need to pull that out separately. The you, college, the web-based college and career exploration for a platform. You can ask the question unless you're asking for it to be pulled out separately. I, I just want to ask a question about the contract in particular. That's fine. It's a simple question. <laughs> You're still gonna. Sorry. No. Just a clarification question. We received an email from, or I received an email, I'm assuming other board members may have, um, school links. And I'm just trying to determine um, the connection between Zello and Naviance and school links and Naviance. Are they two separate? So let's see if we have someone from counseling. If exactly. people can't respond, we have people, we have staff in the back. And they're coming up. <laughs> We can begin by saying they are all different companies. <laughs> and that would be correct. Um, these are all separate vendors that provide similar um, products for students. 
Ma'at Ture, would you introduce yourself? <laughs> Good evening, board. My name is Ma'at Ture Ramin, and I'm the coordinator in the Office of School Counseling. Thank you. So I guess more specifically my question is, is this contract for Zello replacing Naviance, or is it replacing something in addition to Naviance? It is replacing the contract. Um, it will run simultaneous for year one, where we um, are allowing our seniors to go through their college application process with Naviance so that um, there's no disruption in that plan. And then um, simultaneously we'll be um, bringing our juniors and other students into the new platform um, over the course of this upcoming school year okay thank you you're welcome any other questions about k1 through k10 okay. thank you staff may i have a roll call vote please Ms. dominowski yes Ms. frempong Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Wait a second. I gotta get. Oops. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies, and for that I call on the Policy Review Committee Chair, Ms. Pumphrey. Good evening. Good evening. Members of the board, the Policy Re Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 0500, Board Basic Commitments, Workplace Bullying. Policy 2310, Administration, Organization Charts. Policy 4203, Personnel, Compensation, Benefits, Assault, Leave, and Retirement. Policy 4402, Personnel, Separation from Employment. Policy 7260, Facilities and Construction, Designing School Marquee Signs, and Policy 7520, Occupying, Naming or Renaming a School, and Dedication. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit L. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved, Hassan. No, thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Booker Dwyer. And so at the last board meeting, this was pulled because they wanted to revisit the definition of religious holiday. So could you just give a little summary of what happened with the, that definition and, and like just pretty much what happened? That policy actually is not part of this grouping. It's it, the number may be. I think so, there may have been conf some confusion with yeah. the number, but the, the um, policy that you're um, speaking to is not referenced in it. So we have to bring that back after discussion. Madam Chair, I can ask um, yes. legal counsel to provide Thank some you. context Thank if you. necessary. Ms. Howie? Thank you for that question, but I think <coughs> there's some clarity that can be provided. <coughs> Good evening, board members. Uh, as Ms. Pumphrey indicated, policy 6301 was returned to the policy review committee at your last meeting, uh, not uh, another policy that is on this list. And again, as Ms. Pumphrey indicated, the definitions are the same, but it was at the request of this board that the policy review committee will be reviewing again policy 6301. So then would that change policy 4203, the definition of religious holiday no, in that policy? Okay, that's what I just wanted to find out. Thank you, Ms. Howie. You're welcome. Other questions? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Central and Northeast Area Middle School Boundary Study, and for that I call Mr. Dixit. And friends. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair, Ms. Harvey, members of the board, Dr. Williams. So 
Today we are here to present the committee recommendation for the Central and Northeast Area Middle School Boundaries Study. Join with me are Mr. Paul Taylor of my team. He's the Director of Strategic Planning who coordinated and facilitated this study with Matt Cropper, who is the independent consultant. So with that, I'll ask Mr. Taylor to give you a little bit of background of what this is all about, what led to this study, and then Mr. Cropper will go into more details. Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Next slide, please. As part of our, the ongoing Schools for Our Future Capital program, two middle school projects are underway to add capacity and improve educational facilities for students, the new Northeast Middle School and the renovation of Pine Grove Middle School. The purpose of this boundary study was to establish an attendance area for the new Northeast Area Middle School and expand the attendance area for Pine Grove Middle School. Ten middle schools in the region participated in the boundary process. Next slide, please. A major objective of the boundary process was to take advantage of the increased capacity by balancing enrollment among schools in the region. The new Northeast Area Middle School is expected to have a state-rated capacity of 1,364 students, and Pine Grove Middle School is expected to increase its capacity from 1,197 students to 1,283 students. The boundary study also focus on accommodating the ESOL strategic plan of returning English language learners to their home schools. Next slide, please. The boundary process followed board policy and superintendent's rule 1280, and the study was facilitated by our consultant, Cropper GIS. Each school participating in the study established a committee comprised of the school's principal, two teachers, two community members, and the Area Educational Advisory Chair. Principals fully participated in the study, but were not voting members. The activities of the committee were supported by various BCPS offices, including the Department of Schools, Division of Curriculum and Instruction, Division of Business Services, Division of School Climate and Safety, Division of Human Resources, and Division of Research Accountability and Assessment. Next slide, please. The timeline of the process began with the approval by Dr. Williams to establish a boundary study committee. Meetings of the committee began in January of 2023. The boundary study team met five times from January to March and participated in two public information sessions to engage with the public directly to solicit feedback. The next phase in this process continues this evening with the committee's final recommendation being presented to the board. There will be a public hearing on May 17th, leading to a final decision by the Board of Education on June 13th. Next slide, please. The study committee included equal representation from 10 area middle schools. This slide outlines the schools that participated in this boundary study and their location relative to the two project schools, the Northeast Middle School and Pine Grove Middle School. I would now like to introduce Matt Cropper of Cropper GIS to present the details of the boundary study process and the final recommendation of the boundary study committee. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, members of the board. Uh, it's an honor to be here tonight uh, and to help deliver this recommendation on behalf of the committee. Uh, Matthew Cropper with Cropper GIS. Um, uh, just just uh, touching on this slide, you could see that this is the study area, the area that uh, of all schools that were involved in this particular study. Um, as you could see, it's a very, fairly large area. Um, it covers a large swath of the county. And, um, and the new Northeast Area Middle School is shown there as the, with the red dot. And so you could see that that's, that was in play as well as Pine Grove Middle that's shaded inside the middle of the study area. So we have communicated, had communicated the whole time that anybody in this study area could be impacted, although the, the effort and the goal was to try to minimize the number of students impacted while accomplishing all of our objectives. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so the community-based comprehensive study is ta was tasked with meeting the following objectives to establish a intense area for that new Northeast Area Middle School, 
and also to expand the attendance area for Pine Grove Middle to account for the added capacity and fully leverage all the space that's being added to this, to this area. Next slide, please. We always orient to the committee around the rules and policies that the, the school district has in place, in particular Rule 1280. And uh, part of Rule 1280, there are some primary considerations which, which are to make efficient use of capacity in all affected schools. And while doing that, maintain or increase the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the system. Um, if you go to the next slide, there are some other considerations that they also look at. And these are uh, to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods. So try not to draw the line down the middle of residential communities. Try to keep residential communities intact and together. And if they have to move, they move together. But don't split the line down a residential street, if at all possible. Be mindful of the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns, uh, where they go to school now versus where they may go in any option, and what those differences may be. Uh, minimize the number of times any individual students are reassigned. Not only be mindful of where students are right now, but be mindful of where future construction is, where houses are being built, and what enrollment for projections are indicating for schools in this area. Uh, location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. So this group is focused only on middle school boundary changes, but with that said, we always look at all three levels and what the impact would be on those feeder patterns as they move as lines. So we, we, we show them the, um, the current number of splits and how schools are split from elementary to middle and middle to high, and then what that would look like with any particular option. So they're mindful of the impact on feeder patterns and, uh, and the continuity of those. Other things they always look at that align with best practices across the country are to use geographic features such as uh, railroads and major roads, water bodies and things like that uh, to help define the lines and where they go. And in, on top of all of this, we are also looking at uh, embedding support of the ESOL strategic plan of returning students back to their home school uh, from ESOL centers. And so taking those uh, more from the regional perspective and putting them back in their community schools was also part of this. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little about the committee. Uh, Mr. Taylor uh, talked about them a little bit, but it's a, it, we had a fairly large group in this effort of 41 total members. But 31 of those were voting members. Uh, the principals are non-voting members. They, they help provide a lot of valuable insight and conversation around the tables and small group meetings and discussions. Uh, we had 10 teacher and staff representatives from, from, from across the study area, 20 parents from across the entire study area, two from each school, and then an ed area educational advisory council representative. Um, so we had a good broad-based group that, that lives and works and uh, knows the entire study area and get able to give us perspectives from the areas that they live in and um, as it relates to boundary changes that were being considered. We always tell these committee members to take off your parent hat and when you get around the committee table to put on your committee member hat and focus on what's best for all children in the study area, even if it may impact your student or your neighborhood or your school. Um, we ask them to attend all meetings and to be representatives of the community and tell us what, what things are like in their area as it relates to traffic patterns and where kids are walking, crossing guards and those types of things in addition to support from transportation. And they really collaborate exclusively with each other that we have the public uh, open, it's an open process and transparent. The public can observe these meetings, but we ask the public to, to, to not and, um, get uh, participate in those meetings. And those meetings are really designed for the committee members to work exclusively with each other in small group sessions. And ultimately, at the end of this process, they will present the recommendation to the Board of Education uh, via the Chief of Schools. Uh, next slide, please. There was a, a, a pretty extensive engagement effort to, to notify the public about what was happening and what was upcoming. So before the process even started, the letters were sent to families in the fall of last year regarding this, this process and additional outreach from school, uh, at the schools throughout the process. Uh, like I said, the, we invite the public to come watch all these meetings and when small group work's being done, I always go back and talk to the public and just get sort of their opinions and talk conversations with them to see what their, their, uh, their, their thoughts and observations are around the work. But um, we had a good group of public observers at most of these meetings as it was pretty well attended and, and uh, the public was interested in this process. 
all the meetings were live streamed on BCPS TV, uh, TV and so uh, those meetings are all recorded so we can always go back and look at them if you guys have any questions about a past meeting you can always go back and look at those um, and then all the materials that were provided to the committee all the handouts and maps and uh, figures and everything is available online and we post that online uh, at the day of the meeting so the public can also download and print off all the materials as if they were a committee member so they have everything that the committee members have been looking at. Next me uh, slide, please. We, uh, we invited the, the public to uh, provide input through a, multiple different uh, methods. There's an email that was out there. There's also an online comment form that was kicked off at the very beginning so they could provide input at any particular time. That information was always provided to the committee uh, uh, as it came through at each meeting. Um, translators were available uh, at the public information upon session upon request. And like Mr. Taylor said, we had two public information sessions. We normally, for these processes, just do one public info session, but since it's such a large study area, we, we had two to make sure that people could uh, be cl relatively close to home and, and maximize the opportunity for input. Um, there was an online survey that, that accompanied the public info session, uh, and that was translated in multiple uh, languages, and that online survey uh, yielded 2,731 total respondents. Um, and so it was very good turnout, very good input, and uh, very good participation in the survey that, uh, that we solicited to the public. Uh, next slide, please. The committee considered nine total options uh, throughout the course of the study. Um, we always start with uh, maps, and, and we tell the committee, try to think about any map that, that you think is viable and on the table, so that the, it starts with the process of uh, we start with a couple maps that we bring to them to, to help kickstart the process. They give us feedback, and usually it expands to more maps. And then when we get toward the end of the process, we start to narrow things down. Um, but uh, as the committee was working through these, they reviewed and discussed on uh, small group work, all the materials and, and, and all the information that's been provided to them that we were collecting. Um, and in the end, they recognized that draft option E satisfy, satisfied the most boundary study considerations. Although it was not a perfect scenario, uh, it was one that they felt best met the needs of all children in the area and best uh, adhered to the overall objectives and uh, considerations of this study. Um, before they got to that vote, right prior to that, we had those public info sessions, like I said, where we narrowed down to four maps. There was maps A, B, C, and D that were shared with the public at those public info sessions. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. You can see here, uh, these are just some maps that we, that we shared with the public at that, uh, and then, the, and then also I'm gonna show you some maps that, some iterations that the committee were considering at the final meeting. So this is the current uh, study area and you can see the boundaries. If you go to the next slide, you can see this is draft option A and the, the outline is the current map, the current boundaries, and then the background color are the um, uh, option, is, would be the option. And so this is the option that did receive the most favor from the public as well as uh, the, the committee. Um, they liked this option, with, but they wanted some changes to it. So this was actually the first option we brought to the committee and in the batch of draft baseline scenarios. And the committee looked at this and evaluated and through the course of their study, they made changes to this map and adjustments to this map to clean up feeder patterns and adhere to other concerns that they were hearing from the public. Um, but if you look at the next map, this is option B, was another map that they felt was viable enough to take to the public uh, to, to get some feedback from uh, members of the public at the public info sessions. Next slide, please, is option C. And you can see it's another configuration. You know, um, the zone colors in the background are different shades and different areas were, were impacted and all these various options, but they all did a fairly good job of, of, of utilization and other different factors. Um, but this was map option C. And the next slide, please, is map option D, um, another, another configuration that the committee was considering the, of the final four maps that they had brought to the uh, 
public for their in, in, input at the public info sessions. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that this is map option D1. So when we get got to the final meeting, we always we say, okay, we've got A through D on the floor right now, and we 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 offer the the committee the opportunity to nominate an option for recommendation. So we open the floor for nominations, and, and uh, anybody who nominates an option gets put on the wall for vote and for subject for vote and approval. Um, and anybody has the option also, any committee member, to alter or modify an option for nomination. So this is option D1, which basically a committee member looked at D with changes and that's what they nominated. And this was one of the maps that uh, was put up for consideration for vote. It was not very uh, popular by the committee. Uh, a few people uh, liked it, but it was not one that, was, that went very far with the committee in terms of what they felt was the best map. If you go to the next slide, you'll see this is draft opt in, option E, and this is the map that ended up being the recommendation. And like I said, this is the map that where we started with A, and what we did was after the public info session, we took in cons uh, consideration of all the comments that we had received from the committee through the course of the study and incorporated those into a, a, uh, a map that we felt the committee would, uh, would tr try to adhere to what the committee was asking us and what, the, what they felt was the best map. So we started with A, made adjustments to clean up some small feeder pattern splits. Um, as you can see in uh, strengths of this map that the committee felt were, 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 were viable and strong in this is the New Northeast Area uh, Middle School um, is down in the south in the red. And you can see it stretches from the city all the way to the county. Um, all of the Golden Ring Middle School zone would feed into the New Northeast Area Middle School, which was something that the committee felt strongly about. Um, also, committee members felt like areas around Parkville and that green area, the, the new Northeast Area Middle School should extend into that a little more to, to give students that opportunity that live close to that school that were in that Parkville zone. Um, and that was an adjustment that was made that differed from A, that we had picked up from input provided from the public. Also made other adjustments to, to align um, feeder patterns and balanced utilization, base, basically to incorporate comments and in, in, in input that had been provided from the committee and the public through the course of the study. And this was the map that was recommended by the, uh, voted on by the committee. Next slide, please. As you could see, option E received 66.7% of the votes, um, a, a good majority of, the, of approval from the committee. For option E, uh, there we had 21 voting committee members in attendance. Uh, some committee members did vote for some of the other, other maps, but option E was the clear uh, dominant uh, map that the, most of the committee members across the whole study area voted on to approve for for your consideration and approval. And they felt that this map best, uh, best met the, the needs of all children and um, best adhered to the overall objectives and considerations. Uh, next slide, please. And that's the map one more time. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, just talk a little bit about some of the statistics. So you could see in the, the far right are the, uh, are the utilization, what, what I like to look at, and the yellow, you, the, you could see the utilization imbalances in the yellow, and some schools are at 75, and others are at 111 percent. So there is an imbalance in utilization, where in the recommendation that utilization is very balanced and uh, equitable across the entire study area. Uh, next slide, please. These show the impacts on demographics from uh, the current to the recommendation, and in, in, in most cases. Um, the, uh, the demographics of the schools drew closer to the study area average. Uh, there were um, uh, uh, the, the schools, as they were working through all the other considerations, this is one of the things that they had been looking at. And, and in most cases, the, the, the averages do draw closer to the overall study area um, averages for, for, for most schools. If you go to the next slide, please. 
you could see that uh, there were 1,625 students impacted as a result of this recommendation. Um, and I think that speaks, speaks highly on the committee's work of trying to, trying to do this in an efficient manner with o opening a new building and, um, and rezoning students. Only 1,600 students, 1,625 have been impacted as a result of this recommendation. Um, next slide, please. This is the feeder pattern data. So you could see currently there are 27 total splits from elementary to middle school. And this committee was looking a lot at that. They wanted to uh, minimize the number of splits and bring that down and bring down the small numbers. And um, you could see the committee's recommendation brings that down to 16. And middle school to high school goes from 10 to 13. So um, trying to balance everything out and minimize the overall number of splits, but they did do a good job in making the split efficiency better for this region. Next slide, please. Um, no students that can walk to school were put on any in, put in a different situation. So all students uh, that can walk were still able to walk as a result of this recommendation, which is a good thing. Um, next slide, please. And with that, I'll pass it to. Uh, Mr. Taylor or Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Mr. Cropper. The next step in the process, there'll be a public hearing Wednesday, May 17th at 6.30 at Parkville High School Auditorium. And then the Board of Education is scheduled to vote on the boundary on Tuesday, June 13th at 6.30 here. That concludes our presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any board members have questions? Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you said you had one area educational advisory council member there. From which area? Uh, that would be the, the uh, northeast. Northeast. northeast area. Was there a consideration in, in bringing in the central since this involved both central and northeast areas? We did reach out and they were unable to identify someone to participate. Okay. Um, also, there were 21 of the 31 voting members that voted on the final option. Was there a consider? It was like the third of the voting members were not present to make that vote. Was was there any consideration of all changing to when more members could be there to vote or give input? No, we advised all the committee members to please come. We tell them when they're going to vote. Um, we don't have 100% participation at every meeting. So we felt we had a sufficient number to go ahead and proceed with the vote. I, I understand that part. I think that that final vote, though, would be one of the most important meeting for all, I mean, all members to be a part of, because they're making a decision for a very large portion of the county. That's, all, I'm, that's my concern right there. Uh, also, you talked about the ESOL. I just want to remind um, Paul, Mr. Taylor, excuse me, and Mr. Dixit, the timeline. Was the timeline presented to the Boundary Committee and what time was that timeline that was a part of this presentation? When was that shared with them? That was shared with them up front. Um, they received that. When, in fact, the principals have that information when they identify and ask for volunteers for the committee. So they're aware of the schedule, they're aware of the times and the dates and what's going to happen at each meeting. Thank you. My, my last question I wanted to ask um, about the ESOL strategic planning. Um, I, I know I, I visited Padonia International and they received several, um, you know, whether it was from immigration students throughout the year, you know, placing students that were just in the middle of the session, registering in the middle and trying. I mean, they, they're doing a great job there, but I, I feel that is there a, um, were you able to look at what might be coming down the line as far as next year or previous years? with um, Baltimore County receiving more, um, you know, immigration school-aged students that are going to have, you know, the challenge of learning the English language and the challenge of, you know, are we, are we working them into this process as well? Yes. We met with the um, Office of um, the English Language Learners, the, the office that takes ESOL office, and they provided estimated counts of students um, and we built that into the available seats in each school so that we had room for all the students that they estimated that they would be getting. 
Is that just the current students now, or is that were they trying to, are they forward thinking as far as what might be coming down the line as well? I believe we just use the current counts. Is there any communication as far as, you know, are you guys, I, this might not be a boundary question, but just because it's, it's considered as part of your process of figuring this out. Um, is there any communication where you know when certain, you know, amounts of immigration families are coming into our county and that we're going to be able to, you know, you know, provide services for these children that, you know, are basically learning a brand new language? So that's a part of our staffing allocation, and that's the work of the ESOL office um, where they're analyzing, and it's all year. So there's a pattern, there's a part during the school year where we may see an influx, and we built around that to provide that staffing to the school. But keep in mind the reason why we are decentralizing the centers, we had this other phenomenon where some families were not seeking the ESOL language or resources because because they wanted to stay in their home school. So um, this is the work that we do around the English language learners and the work that we do with our schools. And the added bonus is that we're looking at, as I mentioned, decentralizing the center so the students can be in their home school. So we are preparing for just what you're describing. We won't say it's perfect because sometimes we just don't know the numbers. Um, as I presented the budget in January about the growth of our English language learners, but we will continue to monitor that. So I just add to that, um, the sp in, in terms of space, if you look at the estimated utilization for after uh, option E, you'll see that most of these numbers are 84, 90, 87 percent, indicating that from the capacity point of view, there will still be seats available there. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Ms. Harvey? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. How were the parents selected to participate uh, in the process? There's two parents from each school. Can you tell us what that selection process was, and I'll just ask my follow-up question now. Also, um, you talked about best practices and attempting to keep communities together as you set these boundaries. How are, you, how are you defining community, or how did the committee define community? Is it intact neighborhoods, a collection of neighborhoods? Can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like? I'll address the first question first. Um, and then I may refer to um, Mr. Cropper to talk more about the planning block process. What we do is we identify the schools that are going to participate. We have meetings with the principals, and the principals are the ones that know their communities best. So we ask them to go out and find parents and teachers that can participate in the committee. We send letters to all of the um, parents and households in the zone of the school. So every household gets a letter that invites them to participate and how to participate. But ultimately, it's up to the principal to take those people who self-nominate and then come up with a list. That gets uh, brought forward all the way up to the superintendent's level to decide which ones would be on the committee. And one of the things we try to do is have a diverse group. Um, so I can tell you that in this process, uh, we made sure that um, first issues were considered in the makeup of the committee. Ms. Pumphrey? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you have, oh, sorry. I can, I oh, can comment sorry. on sorry. your sec Whoa. second question. Yes, please. Um, so the, when, most importantly, we don't want to divide the line down residential streets and things like that. That's, that's, that's what we aim to, to, to avoid. And what we do to enable the committee to do this kind of work without having to have all the technical um, ex expertise like we have is we develop what we call planning blocks. And so we look at the district or the study area and we break it up into small pieces, like think of it as pieces of a puzzle. And when we develop those planning blocks based off of where we see how the roads are configured around and where students are. And so often if, if, there's a, if there's a community where there's just one road access, one roadway into it and one roadway out, we'll keep that in its own 
planning block. Um, we try to keep them at a certain size so that we have some variability in, in the ability to make different options. But um, everybody has a different definition for community and neighborhood. It's kind of more of a fluid, um, it's more of a fluid definition. So we don't, uh, don't align with any formal definition of neighborhood or community when we develop these, but we do it with the mind of trying to keep students who play together and after school and um, you know people who, who socialize together within their, their neighborhood keep them together so we don't divide neighborhoods in multiple parts. That's what we try to do, um, at, if at all possible. Okay. All if right. I could add, um, the, at the first meeting that we have with the committee, one of the first things we ask them to do is review the planning blocks and to tell us, since they know their communities best, do they think any changes should be made to these because they know which neighborhoods are, make sense to be kept together? Okay, Ms. Pumphrey. First, I just um, wanted to thank the uh, committee members for the, um, for the Boundary Study Committee because I observed one of the meetings simply because I've never seen the process before, so I thought as a board member I should observe that process. And um, you mentioned how you asked the members to take their parent hat off, and I actually observed a parent who did not like the idea of their student needing to go to a different middle school, but she chose that option because it benefited more students. So um, I, I thought that spoke a lot as far as um, the commitment of the committee itself. Um, and I also just, not as a criticism at all, but I, for, the fu for future thoughts, I would like to think um, about how we may intentionally seek out some communities that are seem to not be responding to the public comment or inquiries or questions or surveys. Uh, I think the committee itself was made up of all of those different um, communities, but when you look at the parent input, the survey responses, even the people in attendance at some of the public hearings, um, I think some of our communities were underrepresented. Un underrepresented. I'm not quite sure why, but I think as a commit commitment from the board and also staff that we should, in the future, think of ways to intentionally reach out to these communities. I know we're sending letters. I know we're doing as much as we can, but just based on the numbers, I think that we need to try to do more to make sure that we're reaching the underrepresented communities throughout the process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Mr. McMillian. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm going to try to behave. <laughs> uh, I want to echo Ms. Pumphrey's statement about the committee members. I attended one of those meetings, and those people, they were diligently broken, broken up into the groups and tried to help the public answer the questions. So now I have some questions. Mr. Cropper, how many years has your company been in business? Um, since 2005. Okay, so we're looking at 17 um, years, 17 18, year, 18 yes, years. 17 years, yes, sir. Have you been involved in, in the boundary studies all along, 18 years? Um, it's, I believe it's been about 15 or 16 years that I've done uh, different studies for Baltimore County, yes, and sir. So you've done boundary studies for us, for Baltimore County, for how many years? I would say, no, I, I'm sorry. I have been doing boundary studies across the country f for the whole time that we've been in business, but for Baltimore County, it's been about 16, about 16, 16 years. years, yes, sir. Okay, did you design a presentation that was shown with us, to, to us just now? It's, the presentation is, uh, has evolved over time. It's something that we, we work on collaboratively with the Office of, of Strategic Planning to develop. So, so there were 11 middle schools, right? I believe yeah. so, yes, sir. There were the two going through renovation or new, and then nine more. You, you mentioned feeder schools, and there were a number of different slides about high schools, but I didn't see one slide about, and maybe I overlooked it, and tell me if I did, any elementary slides pertaining to elementary schools and where those kids were going to go? The, yes, sir, the feeder pattern tables do show the elementary to middle school okay. progression. What slide was that? Um, 26. Did I somehow miss that? Let's see, if you look on slide, the feeder pattern slide on slide 26, um, we don't have it in, it's not actually uh, in this presentation, presentation okay. but it is in the handout that talks okay. about elementary to middle. So there's yes. 11 middle schools. Is it correct that there's 46 elementary schools involved in this? There's a good number okay, of Okay, so it totals schools. 57 schools. That just seems, in your experience, are you, have you, do you have a lot of experience or previous experience 
with boundary studies with that many schools? It just seems to me like that's a lot of schools. It is. It is a lot of schools. It's probably the largest study we've done in Baltimore County, um, but it's not the largest study we've done uh, as a company at Cropper GIS. We've done, we have done county and division wide studies that, are, that are for elementary, middle, and high school. When you guys talked about this study, did you, did you talk about quadrants, like breaking up the 57 schools into smaller quadrants that might be more, you, and you know, people could, could, could understand that information more? Did you talk about that? Mr. McMillian, thank you, but your time your, is up. Now, I, I got a question about okay. that. All I right. know we got a new guy doing the time. Is, is that is that is is that my time or is that his answers included in that? Mr. Burns. Darren Burns, for the record, Ms. Amelia, I do stop at any time you finish stop. Yeah, I mean you finish the uh, talk. I don't. Can I comment? Okay. I don't think that was what I don't think that was a question. I think he was just asking if they could still respond to his question. Oh no, I, I, I thought he asked whether I'm stopping the clock. Okay. Yeah, so you are stopping the clock when, when the board the member, answer, right. right, when a board member stops, you only time us, not the responses. Right. And that's, okay. So that was my three minutes. That was three minutes. Just I think it was the questions you asked, but he can still respond to your question. So gentlemen, can you please respond to Mr. McMillian's question? Well, I, when we do our work, uh, typically BCPS provides the framework for the boundary study that we, that we uh, facilitate. And so um, the, dis the district works through the evaluation and determination of, what, of, of the study area based off of the needs of the schools and identifying neighboring schools and adjacent schools that have the need and, and those that could help as well. Um, and so I'm typically not a, a, a part of the, of the decision making process, the planning process around how the study area looks. I work with the study area that's been determined um, by BCPS, and and then I work with that to facilitate that group. And at, at the end, if all the que I've got two critical questions. At the end, maybe if people are done, would you consider my two critical questions? Yes, or maybe one of your friends will ask your question around you if they're not planning on asking questions. So we could stick with the time limit. Miss Frempong, did you have a question? I did. Hi, gentlemen. Um, I have a different perspective because I've been on these boundary studies for multiple schools, whether it's elementary or middle school. I think the process itself is very thorough. Um, my concern in particular with this one and then just even other boundary studies that we have is that when we have the uh, public input, it can be very skewed to just hear from one community. And I think that's some of what um, my fellow board members were saying. Um, the primary considerations for the boundary study are efficient use of capacity in, in affected schools and maintaining or increasing the diversity among the schools. But if we look at this final option, um, one school in particular goes from 84% to 90% just to allow a community to stay together. Um, and that's a secondary concern, maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods. Um, another thing that happened is with the ESOL, um, being removed from, um, is that my time? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay. Keep going. Okay. Um, with ESOL being removed from Dumbarton as a center, one of the considerations that came up or comments from a parent was about um, having Halstead Academy as an elementary school being able to attend um, Dumbarton Middle School. And that was something brought up as a parent, and but we never came back to that. So I think sometimes it's just the voices that we hear. Um, the survey, again, overwhelmingly one group, one population. Um, and then, to be fair, Mr. Cropper, the D1 option that was presented is presented very cleanly here. It was difficult to really see all the things that I just saw. It was different seeing it there than seeing it here. And also, we didn't have um, numbers as far as how that started affecting things. So I just think um, it's a great process, but I do think we have to be very considerate in reaching out to that community 
um, that we may not hear their voices. Maybe they're not online. Maybe they're not able to come to these public input because lack of transportation, work, et cetera. And their voices is important as well, not just one particular community. And we do have to remember the primary considerations of these of the boundary study. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. So my, I have two questions. My first question is, um, how is school diversity factored into the selection of an option and the overall boundary study? It's one of the components of data that we uh, analyze and report for the committee in addition to utilization and um, feeder patterns and walkability and impacts. Um, it's, it's one component of data that is presented to the committee for their review and study. Is there any type of rubric or rating or weight given to certain factors? So you, so it's just everything just presented to the committee and then they decide, or is there certain factors that have a heavier weight than others? We don't weight any of the factors uh, uh, in, Bal in Baltimore County. Uh, we uh, basically, we, we tell the committee the best plan is one that adheres to all of these considerations as best as possible um, with, with the, as, as the rules are, are stated. Um, and so there is no rubric or metric that weights the different uh, criteria. So we know that students learn best in a diverse environment. And when I look at option E and the demographics for this school, it is not, it, it's not truly reflective of Baltimore County. And so I'm just wondering, especially when I look at some of the neighboring schools, it just feels like there are a lot of students, a certain demographic of students that will be in this school compared to some of the neighboring schools. And so I would just like to see how is that addressed and how can we ensure that Baltimore County students are learning in truly diverse environments and it doesn't feel like certain groups of students are all being placed in a school that has over a thousand students. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at other schools, it's not that many students. Are you referring to the new school, the new Northeast? I'm looking, I'm looking right for the new for option E. Yes, at the new Northeast Middle School. East, right. And, and I, the I, demographic percentage, yeah, that, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had studied these uh, extensively as well. And one of the things that you'll, you'll notice is that the new Northeast Area Middle School encompasses all of Golden Ring. Um, and so Golden Ring is, does not have a zone in this particular plan. Um, and so, but, and if you look at Golden Ring, the demographics of Golden Ring are skewed even greater than what the recommendation has. Um, and the recommendation for the new Northeast Area Middle School does extend um, all the way out to the county. And so the, 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 the committee was looking at ways to to do as best as they could with, uh, but there are limitations that they have with where communities are and the, the demographic composition of communities in relative to the schools. And, um, and then looking at trying to make things even more balanced, you start to deviate greatly from others in such, in, as it relates to transportation, uh, efficiency, or potentially overcrowding a building or underutilizing a building and trying to get, uh, demographic percentages to a even better, more favorable to match what the study area is. It's a large study area and it does have a very wide range of communities and demographics and socioeconomics. And um, so, but that, that one of my observation was, was that if you look at the new school, given that it does pick up all of Golden Ring and then some, it's, it's, it's an improvement and from demographic uh, composition perspective, com the new school is, is more demographically diverse than Golden Ring is as it currently sets. Um, but it's, no plan is perfect and there are, um, there are still challenges and uh, imbalances, but the committee felt like this, this plan was the one that best adhered to those considerations as, as best as possible. Okay, that's all I'll ask. Thank you. Ms. Dr. Savoy? Okay, um, anybody can answer this. 
anyone can answer. Are you familiar with redlining? I am, yes ma'am. Your presentation suggests that you are engaging in redlining, separating neighborhoods according to socioeconomics and maybe some other things. Is this what's happening? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, we aren't. We are not redlining in this process. How are you determining um, who is going to what schools? We look at the location of students to their schools. We look at school utilization and. Um, how many seats each school has and how many students can fit in them. Um, and we look at um, the, all these different components that I had showed the data points mm -hmm. to try to evaluate um, and provide a solution that best meets the needs of all children but while accomplishing our objectives. But you did mention socioeconomics. Socioeconomics is part of the demographic data that we examine in terms of the impacts uh, for looking at current schools and what the options may be. Okay, thank you. Ms. Dominowski. Yes, um, just echoing the concerns of not hearing from every community, why was it just determined to make this boundary study so large? The schools we selected were those that were surrounding the schools that were getting the additional seats. So if Pine Grove Middle was getting additional seats, well, that means any edge of that school boundary could change. So the schools that shared that boundary should be included. And with the new Northeast uh, Middle School, the schools that were in that area should be included. So that's, it was a geographic decision. The problem I have with that is that, like Baltimore County, is the areas are so diverse in them, and you subset them smaller, they're so diverse. So there are gonna be some portions of that area that are gonna, are gonna come out and speak right away, and then those other communities that aren't as, you know, following as closely are gonna get swept under the rug and be outspoken by the ones that are. And I think that's where we miss the mark in this boundary study, and we're not, um, you know, examining that whole, it, 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 I mean, it just shows with the whole, with central, not having a central area advisory person there and then concentrating on Northeast. I, I, I have a problem with that in this study and the fact that it's so large and um, we're losing sight of the smaller communities within Baltimore County. Um, Ms. Pumphrey. Two very quick questions. I think you already answered this question, but um, so all of Golden Ring Middle School Everyone zoned for Golden Ring is going to attend the new Northeast Middle School, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, and just one additional question. Um, as far as Red House Run Elementary, do we know if all of those students will also be attending Northeast or Stemmers Run or a combination? I don't uh, know that offhand, but I can uh, find that information for you and, okay. and follow up with you. What was, can you repeat the question one more time? Run. Red House Run. Red House Run Elementary students. And, uh, and feeding, you were asking if they feed into which school? Yeah, uh, uh, I, well actually which are they? What what? It is, are they all going to the nori, Northeast, new Northeast um, Middle School or Stemmers Run Middle School or a combination of both? Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions from? I was trying to bring up the policy real fast, but I can't do it with navigating everything else. Does the policy talk about using all schools that touch the effect, the school that you're trying to work on with boundary? Does policy talk about pulling all the ones that touch it, like the, the affected boundaries? The, to Ms. Dominowski's point about why we had so many this time. So you had two schools that you were trying to work on, Pine Grove Middle and the New Northeast. And then were all those schools, because those all have boundaries that would touch the new, those two schools? That's correct. Okay, is that per policy? No, I, okay. 12, no, the policy does not state that. Okay. Um, that's been the practice. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cropper? Um, just to follow up, uh, all of Red House Run uh, feeds into the new, the new Northeast Middle School and Thank the you. recommendation. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Williams, did you want to? Well, I just want to remind the board, um, thank you for your feedback um, and the questions. I uh, appreciate that. I uh, just want to reiterate what the team said. You know, when do we get an opportunity to open up a brand new middle school? And if you look at slide 23 and see all of the overcrowded middle schools, we had to expand, so it didn't make sense to just touch one aspect of that part of the county and not try to address all of those other schools. And so I appreciate the, the feedback, and I, I will also want to associate the Boundary Study Committee and the work of the principals to get members to participate um, on the timeline and to be active participants and provide feedback. It's, it's never easy, and I want to thank you all for presenting this, but I think some of what was shared in the presentation answered some of the questions. We had to look at a broader span because of what was happening on the Northeast area side. And, and, and again, this is how, how often do we open up a brand new school? I just, I just have to go, go there. And if you look at some of these schools, um, I think many of our students will be appreciative of what they had and now what they potentially will have with the work part two of what the design of the building looks like. So um, I think you've given us a lot of things to think about and your investment. And I also want to acknowledge you attending the boundary study meetings and actually observing the, the process. Um, we take this seriously because we don't always get this opportunity. And we have a lot of work to do with our facilities. Um, and I want to thank the team uh, led by Mr. Dixon and thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, but I think you've given us a lot of questions. And, and as we move forward with additional feedback, um, there, there may be some th things we will look at. But again, I just want to go back to there seems to be a lot of question about why this, the scope. But if you go back and look at just the utilization and where we were as a system on that side, <clears throat> it made sense. Some may not like it, but it made sense. We had to expand because when you open up a brand new school, people want to attend. And so I, I just appreciate some of these hard decisions and the flexibility to kind of receive the feedback and make amendments as we were going through this timeline to be able to present something back to the board. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, and thank you um, for your presentation. And I know it's a mammoth amount of work to do a boundary study. I've been involved in several. So um, thank you. And thank you to the committee. Um, it is a lot of nights. It's a lot of tedious work. It's a lot of analyzing. Um, and it's a lot of decision making um, with competing priorities. So um, thank you again. Thank um, we are not finished the process. As you stated in the beginning, we still have the um, community, I know there's a word, hearing. And then we will come back in June as a board and vote um, on the option. So thank you to everyone who contributed. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is information items, including the minutes of the February 27th and March 27th for the Southeast Area Education Advisory Councils. I know Ms. Brewster watches our meeting, so thank you, Ms. Brewster, for those um, very detailed notes. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, board member comments for anyone who may have them, as well as agenda setting. If you are giving an agenda topic, please state, um, also explain your why behind it to help us as we move forward in setting future agendas. Um, I'll start on this side. Again, if, you're not, if you don't have anything to add, no worries. So Ms. Booker Dwyer, do you have anything at this point? No, not at this point. Okay, thank you. Mr. McMillian? No, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Savoy? Only the Equity Committee. Did you want that? No, or this would be wait. board member comments. If you have any comments or agenda items, we'll do um, committee reports next time. Okay. No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Just a quick um, thank you to all of our teachers. I know next week is Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, and um, throughout my observate visiting of schools, um, I've come into contact with many teachers and observed many teachers who go above and beyond um, what they're required to do in the classroom. And just wanted to acknowledge that and to thank our teachers. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Nothing on my end. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Harvey. No agenda items. Just a reminder that the next building and contracts meeting is Monday, June twelfth at five p.m. Thank you, and Ms. Frumpong. 
Um, I'm going to echo Christina. Uh -huh. So um, thank you so much to our teachers for what they do. Um, for this week, we have Substitute Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you to the substitutes. That's particularly difficult to come in and, and be teacher for the day or for the week, or but just to come in and try and um, fill the shoes of the teacher. Um, and thank you to our principals from yesterday with Principal Appreciation Day. So that's all. Thank you. Ms. Domanowski? Um, I just have one um, policy I'd like us to review, um, policy rule 1280 as my reasoning for ten is based on tonight's presentation that we need to include all feeder schools or, def or define the definition of affected schools to not just include, um, if you have a middle school, it should include the elementary schools that those that middle school feeds into, high school, same thing, middle school and elementary school so that all community members are represented. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you for those details. So that would be a policy and a review um, agenda item. Um, I'd also like to echo and thank our principals, our teachers, our substitutes, um, and everyone who um, contributes to the success of our students. The last item on the agenda is announcements. As we said, oh no, tomorrow, May 3rd, is the board's public hearing on the Golden Ring Middle School program closure, which will be held at Eastern Technical High School, the cafeteria. Sign up for speakers begins at 5.30 and the hearing will begin at 6.30. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 16th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>